Welcome to today's episode of the podcast where we discuss the most recent installments of a different series every show. X-Men 97 is Disney Plus's revival of the X-Men animated series, which ran from 1992 to 1997. It continues where the original series ends, which is pretty cool. The murder of Charles Xavier or Professor X. Did you watch the original X-Men series? No, I used to watch in the 90s. I would watch Spider-Man. I would watch Batman, the animated series, and I would watch Batman Beyond. And then later on, I would watch Justice League a bit. But no, I, I had peripherally heard about this series when I watched the live action uh, movies. Yes. And, uh, and and it was strange because I knew that Wolverine was going to be quite different going into the series, mm-hmm. but I didn't know Magneto was. Magneto has to be the most, like, his on screen, he has a relationship with Rogue. Yes. No, I know. The uh, Xavier. What is the age difference? The Xavier Magneto relationship in the show is so much different than it is in the movie. Is it though? Because they're both friends. And this totally seems like something that Xavier in the movies would do. He dies and he says, you know, well, he's not. Here's the thing. He's not actually dead. Season five the show did a lot of things that the movies did. But first, obviously, because it came out in 1992, the first season tackled the Days of Future Past storyline. Season three was Dark Phoenix. Season four, Apocalypse, was a huge villain. In fact, season four was where the series was going to end because Cyclops, Gene, and Cyclops seems like more the main character than even Wolverine in this series. But Cyclops, Gene, and Xavier were going to leave the Xavier school and then some other people like Archangel and uh, characters Archangel? were going to join. Yes. And so then, but then season five came around and it turns out that Xavier isn't dead. The public thinks that he is, but really uh, he's up in space getting treatment. So like you said, but I also wanted to talk about- just... I hear you've lost me at this point. <laughs> I think you're going a little ahead because as an audience member, just tuning in for the first time, these X-Men students- do not know that their boss is alive. No, I know. So you're just telling me he's off in the clouds getting treatment? Yes, what Xavier did was he left the, the school in main Magneto's They didn't hands. even do it previously with this information. Yes. So, so, so it I, feels like stuff I'm not supposed to know. No, no, no. no. This is all shown in it's the finale canon. of season five. Yes. But I wanted to talk about the influence of this series because it has an 8.4 of the original series, the animated series, 8.4 on IMDb, around 50,000 reviews, 83% on Ron Tomatoes, critic score, audience score, 93%. And that actually transitions into uh, my first game here. It's Choose the Lie. Well, I know a because... little bit about this show. Okay, so then you might be able to actually figure it out because this game centers on the success of the original series. If you're not able to figure it out, there is a follow-up question, so we'll see how you do. But the first one you have to pick the lie is the original series was so popular that for a Saturday morning cartoon, it reached a viewership of over 23 million households. That's the first 23 one. Million? 23 million? I mean, Saturday morning cartoons are pretty legit. Uh, I will go ahead and say true well again you have to pick the lie here yeah so the second one is the three main voice actors norm spencer who voiced cyclops cal dodd who voiced wolverine is also uh, wolverine in this series and lenor zan who played rogue became the highest paid tv voice actors of the 90s that's the simpsons second. simpsons man that's the, all the simpsons i'm pretty sure the third one is the series responsible for beginning the development of the 2000 film with the film borrowing the uh, plot lines from the first few episodes the and, first few episodes were the plot line so wolverine showed up in the first few episodes uh, like as a newbie no because jubilee was that's that's who it was so i would feel like there's only one lie right yeah there's only one lie how could they be the 90s most expensive? Like, that's just the Simpsons people are so rich at this point. But because of just your facial expression, I'm going to say the third one was the lie. OK, actually, it was the uh, the voice actors. OK, so I was right, but yes. also wrong. <laughs> well, I, I also right. had a last one here. It was the theme song from the original has been included in two MCU projects. This is true because Miss Marvel had the theme song in the episode. And Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, when Patrick Stewart is reintroduced, they use the theme song there. And he also. So they decided to match his uh, his appearance. If you look at it, the green suit, the oh, black tie, yeah, yeah, the yellow hover chair. It was supposed to be uh, based off of that. So again, you didn't get the first one, but the second one. Well, the, the thing about this is you're saying that the first few episodes of the original animated series yes. followed the same plot line of Wolverine coming to the X-Men with Rogue. That doesn't no, seem they like... Took, they took some of the plot But what about Jubilee? Because there is no Jubilee in live action world. I'm talking talking more about just kind of what, what they did with Jean Grey and all of the Xavier schools because the success of the animated series was the reason that the film was greenlit. Mm-hmm. But the second one is okay. this and probably the most important distinction. This is actually separate from the MCU. This is not canon with the MCU. Well, no, it's produced by Marvel Studios. I know. Anime. 
but it's it, but it's not it, it's not part of the MCU. Is it part of the MCU that does the uh, what if show? No, because they show the what if people in the intro. Not only do they show the what if people, they show Fantastic Four from the sixties, the Spider Man from the sixties, oh. who also showed up and across the Spider Verse. There was uh, the Silver Surfer shows up, X Men the animated series, but this is still not part of the MCU, even though it's part of the MSA. <laughs> but but the re- but the reason I want to ask this is because there are animated series coming to Marvel that are set in the MCU. You and I wanted to see if you could guess which one is fake. So the first one is Star Lord, a five part series following Peter Quill, voiced by Chris Pratt, following the events of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, coming out later this year. Okay, well, we do see where he ends up at the end of the movie, and it seems like his character. Don't they say Star Lord will return? Yes, they do. Yeah, okay, go ahead. So the second one is Your Friendly Neighborhood Spider Man. It's not going to be voiced by Tom Holland, but it's kind of a prequel series that traces Spider Man in high school. So much Spider Man stuff. I that one I heavy doubt the yep. third one is eyes of wakanda it tells the story of wakandan warriors who travel to the world to retrieve, retrieve dangerous vibranium both are set to come out in 2024 that sounds sort of like the plot of the last one but yeah moving on and then the last one is marvel zombies a four-part series based oh, on the comic true. of the same name yes and the 2021 what if episode yes so i will have to say the second one the second one actually your friendly neighborhood spider-man is going to be coming out later this year the weird thing is charlie cox is already set to reprise his role as daredevil but they're not going to have tom holland the fake one was actually star lord that one does not so exist it's not going to be an animated yet. series that yes. would have been my second guess um so let's talk about this show a little bit more i know that it was created and written by bo de mayo or Bo Bo and he just got fired. Yes, it was it was very <laughs> shocking news because he wrote the first season. He already wrote all the second season. He already wrote all the second That's season. That's why they fired him. They were like, we don't have to pay him now, well, he and we was, can still produce He this. was even thinking of season three ideas, like kind of uh, really r- trying to write them down and was about to start writing on it, and then they just decided to fire him. And it seems so shady. Is there something we should know or that we do know? As a, or is it kind of like the Walking Dead firing where he was just going over budget? and, and uh, There was no reports as to why he was fired yet. And no speculation yet. It, but it's strange because he's also going to be doing Blade, whatever the film that's coming out in 2025. Whatever he did, it must have been pretty serious. I think, though, that I read the first rumor was that he was asking for way too much money. I, I don't know if that's true. Um, And so, yeah, the original cast returned, which I found refreshing because nowadays, Every time you like, I wouldn't be surprised if this Spider Man neighborhood Spider Man guy was like someone uber famous. Like Timothy Chalamet (laughs) came in and started (laughs) doing the Timothy Chalamet for Tom Holland. (laughs) Yeah. And then they bring in in Zendaya again. And it's (laughs) that weird dynamic between all of them. Uh, But everything about the show's characters is the same but different. Yes, I recognize most of them. If you've seen the movies, you'll know most of them. There were a few that I didn't. Bishop, Morph. Morph is like the comic relief, but also got like Mystique's power. But while he can also change into other looking people, he can use their abilities as well. Yes. He seems a little off. He has actually the most interesting, I thought, character. He's a uh, little Deadpool-ish too. Backstory. Because what happened with Morph was in the original series, he was supposed to die in the pilot but he became such a fan favorite that they ended up bringing him back and his appearance in this is a lot different than it was in the show interesting and then with bishop yeah bishop is now also shown in the intro when you say the original show he says he's different is anybody else look completely different than their past no i think i think all of them look remotely the same aside aside from jean gray oh oh, in and storm because storm is now wearing a mohawk that's (laughs) actually part of that's something that's completely different and they're going into what uh got fans really excited Excited is one of Storm's best story arcs. It's a two-parter comic, and it's going to be a two-parter episode this season. We'll get to the episodes in a second. I did want to also say that Wolverine and Beast have the same haircut. Like up, <laughs> up and back above their ears, they they both have the Wolverine cut, which was interesting. And also Beast is probably the most different from the films, wouldn't you say? Because he's supposed to be nope, a worse man than this. Oh, yeah. Magneto's, the, I guess. But I'm talking about the actual Wolverine mutant. is the stupider version. Like, I, he is does not remind me of Hugh Jackman at all. Hugh he Jackman, have... listen, listen to Cal Dodd when he was doing, when he was trying to become Wolverine. He made it his own character. <laughs> I don't mind it that much. The first episode of here is called, To Me, My X-Men, right? Yes. Cyclops, the, I'm going to give you the description that you can read online, and then I'm going to give you my description. Okay? okay. Cyclops races to find the source of new anti-mutant technology. So mutants are the heroes. And humans are the humans, and a lot of the humans are scared of the uh, mutants. And scientists are out there saying that they are the next form of um, of humanity. They're the next form of evolution that's coming about. And so these sentinels that the humans have created to come in as 
and terrorize the mutants, kill them all off. Uh, they're back, and within the first episode, Cyclops and the rest of the gang goes in, kills a bunch of bad sentinels. A lot of regular humans just use their arms, so you could call them yeah. handy, and like they they try, and they are actually pretty successful at fighting the X Men. But I would just sum up this episode. My version of it is Magneto inherits the X Men because that is the <laughs> twist at the end: is that Magneto shows up, who was the main villain of the original series, and says, "You know what? I'm actually let bygones be bygones. I'm going to live." my life like Charles would have wanted and I'm going to try to keep humanity and uh, and the mutants together and so that's how episode 1 leaves off episode 2 mutant liberation begins when Magneto is forced by the UN to stand trial so now that he's a good guy suddenly the laws come out <laughs> and uh, he's taken in and a group of anti-mutant rioters in a very similar vein to January 6th uh, bust in and try to have him killed However, um, it, well, I'll get into my version of it, is that Storm gets nerfed. In the Storm gets, yeah, episode yeah, two is right. Storm gets nerfed because she takes a bullet for him, but it's like an energy bullet, which zaps her powers away. And in the past, whenever shows do this, Heroes, for instance, mm -hmm. when they take Peter Petrelli's power away from him, or Superman the movie, when they take uh, his power away from him, or X-Men, uh, the, the third movie, right? That's when they take uh, uh, Magneto's, the sand. Yes. Magneto's power away from him. They don't usually, that usually is like the, like them ch jumping the shark. Like <laughs> it's the show or the movie realizing, the writers realizing that they've written themselves into a corner and they need to make this character less powerful. And I really like how they did it with Storm, however, because throughout the first two episodes, there's a lot of uh, foreshadowing. They call her one of a, the Omega powered. Mm -hmm. uh, they call her, uh, Magneto calls her what's closest to a goddess. Um, compared to the rest of them. And I agree because she never uses her storm ability to the maximum potential that she has. If she wanted to, she could make every single raindrop into like a tiny icicle that like shoots at a billion miles per <laughs> hour and just murder everyone instantly. If she had the same mental breakdowns that Jean Grey gets all the time, she like X-Men wouldn't be a thing. It would be almost like everybody in was... the world would be dead. <laughs> yeah, because she she can she controls weather, but really it was the wind, right? She wasn't able to feel the wind when she gets Gets her powers zapped. When her powers are zapped, she can't communicate with any the nature around her. She also can't communicate with Jean, and she feels very different. She feels like her that part of her life or that chapter of her life is over. So we see her get on a bus. She writes a letter to the rest of the X Men crew, and then she drives away. And Again, this is this is following one of the most one of her most infamous storylines. The funny thing is that the best version of a hero having their uh, power taken away that I think uh, critically has been released is the Spider-Man 2. I was, they, yeah. Yes, when they do it for him. And that way it works. But it is rare to see it actually succeed. And so they're going to have to like it helps that she's not the main main character that there's just a bunch of main characters with with Magneto's storyline when he's on yeah, yeah. trial they actually took the dialogue straight from issue 200 of X-Men and they they copied it almost like all the designs it was really the redesigns by Jim Lee that they decided to design the characters with but that's the f first time I think in the show where they took just straight up dialogue from the comic and just decided to put it on screen I, I liked it when things went awry and then you had the storm the people storm in there and then he fought the one main v human villain and then uh, at the end they take off his collar which is holding him back right the mutant collar and this is when he sees storm hurt and he pulls up the entire courtroom pulls them all the way to the <laughs> sky and the animation there is really cool even though they've stuck with the old 90s animation so that was my favorite part of the series i really like the second episode as compared to the first um do you remember in harley quinn you like that show right yes uh what they did to the joker yeah, they made him like a politician in the third season. Yeah, yeah, but what did they do to him? Like they instantly, they instantly nerfed him too. Yeah, he and wasn't so, as he definitely was not as intimidating. My as argument movies. here is Storm isn't the only one who got nerfed. They took their main villain Magneto, yeah. and they made they put a cuff on him in his mind where he can no longer kill willy nilly. He has to work within the limits of uh, of humanity and society, what they're willing to allow him to do. And so he, in a way, has also been put, a, but with the Joker, it worked really well, right? Yes. He's, he's still insane, but at the same time, he has a moral compass. Right. So Magneto is the same way, super powerful, kind of crazy, <laughs> 
but he also has that moral compass. So I think he's going to end up being a good team leader. And Scott saw that at the end of, I think, episode two, and that everybody sort of came around to that uh, line of thinking. So at the same time, Jean Grey just had her baby. Yes. And and so they name it Nathan. And it had to be, I guess, uh, uh, the person who had to do the operation because for a C-section was Rogue. She took, <laughs> she stole the doctor's brain, like its ideas, because the doctor was didn't want to do it. I guess he's he's very uh, per- particular about his patients. And so uh, he was he, he didn't like mutants. Yeah. And so she does the operation. And then at the very, very end, the twist here is that another gene shows up knocking on the door. Right. So you there, just know all there, these things. I was there, hoping for a one second. There have not been, I mean, Jean Grey and, and who she is, that has been the biggest point of theories among fans why there's been multiple of them because they realized that her hair she was Kenny? her her hair was a lot Kenny different from South Park? her hair was like straightened and people were like wait a minute this doesn't seem exactly right and people are thinking that in between season two and season three with Jean Grey there's a time where a character named Mr. Sinister uh, ended up kidnapping her and they're thinking that possibly Jean Grey in season three through five and even here has not been the Jean Grey that we originally knew of and they and Mr. Sinister is supposed to show up in this series at some point. So they're thinking that's what the reveal is going to be. That's what most people think is going to happen. Wait, so the person that has the baby. Yes. Who is she then? She was a different version. She's almost the alien version. But did she know that? Yeah, I think so. Oh my god, so she I, really knows. Yeah, that. so she she so kind no of is she's evil. been trying to get out of there. I mean, she <laughs> So goofy. That's actually okay. Let's get to my pros and cons, yes. right? So you don't have to be a fan of the original series to watch this one. I like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, two, it's a kids show ultimately, so there are some corny moments, but these are pros because everyone is yoked, and it's kind of <laughs> it's always funny when you see that they're jacked, uh, they're eating their spinach. Um, there's dance club scenes that are goofy. Pick up basketball games when things aren't going crazy. Yes, the basketball was actually, there was a lot more scenes in the comics of them playing basketball. So that was an homage to that. Well, they've done it, I think, twice already in these two episodes. And I think it, Gambit, who wears the, like his shirt and his hair, like he uses that as a, <laughs> whatever. And so his shirt's for skins is what I'm saying. <laughs> um, and then, it, but they can't use their powers. Mm-hmm. However, I think it would be cool, like in a all steroid league, if there was also the basketball them playing it with their powers is gambit the one that sees rogue walk out of mag magneto's room and then drops the queen of hearts right i thought that he actually saw storm leave but you might be right because rogue is does go inside there and they in the first episode i think that no at the beginning of the second episode they showed that rogue and um, magneto had a relationship but by the end of the second episode is when they've already recaptured them yeah see so rogue and uh gambit they were supposed to be together and rogue even said that they would always be together so this so, so when the he, ice man isn't a thing when here. he drops the queen of hearts it's supposed to kind of be his heart like kind of going into his stomach and realizing this isn't going to happen the interesting thing about rogue's ability is even in the first x-men movie there was a relationship between those two characters but it was much more like i can understand your ability because i am so powerful that you can still touch me and it won't like super duper hurt me does Mm -hmm. that make sense yes that's what i remember from it uh but but seeing like again magneto with a full head of hair and just like being (laughs) a young uh version of himself and still talking about world war ii so he is still that old so it is a bit creepy rogue is also southern which i don't think she's or at least they didn't portray her as southern in the movies and the reason yeah the reason the reason for that well no i was gonna say (laughs) the reason why uh, that Gambit and Ro- uh, Rogue were not together just right away is because of her power. Because whenever you touch, yes, her, that's always been her deal. Yes. Like that, literally in the movie was because like her, she hurt her boyfriends and her family wanted to get rid of her. That's very the boys. If yes, you, if you ever get into that. And this show also reminds me of Invincible, um, just animation. Well, style. Ross Marquand, who is from uh, Avengers: Infinity War, he was Red Skull. He was also Aaron in The Walking Dead. He is he voices in Invincible, but he's also Professor Xavier in this. I, I still can't believe that Xavier is just watching down from the clouds like God. <laughs> the second episode, Magneto, when he's on trial, I told you the riot was pretty interesting because it seemed like as much of it being a kid's show, like I just said, it also is like poignantly pushing towards certain things. Like Magneto's whole deal in the second episode is he wants one of the uh, world's colonies to become adapted or be accepted by the UN. Mm -hmm. I I don't know what the name of it is, but it's like a a city that's full of mutants, I assume. And so there's that. And then one of the senators or the judges who are um, looking at Magneto, who originally seemed like they're going to try against him, 
is a lot like Lindsey Graham. <laughs> Yo, Joe, how, how do you mean? He looks like Lindsey Graham, and I, I think they actually built him to, to be Lindsey Graham. Uh, the climax is Magneto pulling them all up into the sky, kind of saying, don't make me have to turn into a villain again. Like, I can actually help this world, and I think he does a good job convincing them, or he at least uh, intimidates them enough. And then, Well, he uh, says something along the lines of, like, let me show you, right? Or he's like, don't let me... Uh... Yeah, he had a really cool line. Yeah. It'd I be remember. great if we knew it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and then there's the relationship between Gene and Wolverine. Has that ever been a thing? Like, not in the... I don't think so. Because that is I'm, such a yeah. crux of the movies. Yes, but here I don't think that Wolverine has really ever been jealous. jealous. Well, I think that Wolverine, Cal Dodd, his, he, he's supposed to be a lot different from Hugh Jackman oh, in that he's just supposed to be very gritty, but he only cares about himself, egotistical. Yeah, he doesn't just care about himself. At the very end of the second episode, you see Morph go with a bunch of beers to the tree that Wolverine is hanging out on. Right. He's just depressed. And uh, and he, he turns into his brother, I think, so that they can have like a rough housing session <laughs> it's it, but i think that's goes to show that morph is really kind of like the heart of the series as well as jubilee um it, i really wasn't aware of her character in the first episode that's more about reintroducing us to everybody there are a lot of name drops that gets more into my cons um, so uh if i yeah. could talk about jubilee for a second in the original series the pilot is all about jubilee and she kind of takes the decosta the character who was who has the mutant color around him the mutant color being something from the original series and the movies as well in the first place he's a mutant and it was supposed to be paralleling jubilee's journey because the x-men say her in the original series yeah. and they saved Acosta here. In fact, and then uh, Acosta gets out of there. He's Scott just like Summers. Yeah. Well, Scott Summers, when they take off his uh his his sunglasses, the same thing happens and he says the same line in the original series where like everything just kind mm. of around him has that huge surge of power. Here's my here's my theory about like uh the Decosta storyline is that he leaves and his he reveals his power is that he has solar radiation or whatever. And the thing that knocks out uh Storm's power is that like all her cells have been damaged to a point where they can no longer admit the same mutant signal. They all have like some sort of guard on them. Mm -hmm. Um and and so I think that the energy of the Decosta character can kind of blow that away and then Storm can be like normal again. The science is obviously ridiculous, <laughs> but uh the, the, yeah, unlike many Marvel shows, this one seems to have a sense of where it's going because it was written by one guy. Shame they had to fire him, but I'm, I'm sure they had good And reason. they're also going to have a lot more characters. And not being part of the MCU, they uh, Marvel has assured that they are going to have so many more superheroes show up throughout the season. They've already <laughs> started showing them because Morph starts changing into people I've seen. I don't know their names, but there was the Sword Girl who was played by Olivia right. Munn and stuff. And I was like, oh, she's part of, oh, no, that's just Morph again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he likes to. And then the uh, giant guy. Uh, the Russian um, skeleton or a guy from uh, Deadpool. You know who I'm talking about. Oh, right? yes. You're talking about Colossus, Colossus. right? Colossus. Yes. He turns into Colossus for a moment. Uh, all right. So my cons are that the first episode climax is pretty weak. They find the Sentinels. They're like, oh, you can never beat us. And then they beat them in like two minutes. The main characters that they introduce, the solar radiation guy, he leaves. So it doesn't really feel like it was necessary. It's very preachy. Oh, okay, so it is. Pre yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, uh, I'm a changed man. The the whole concept of that. I know the world's supposed to be very divided. Even within the first few minutes, you see a poster showing that m people don't like mutants. It's a mutant hate poster. But then they also are showing a newspaper that shows the rich really like mutants. And the mutants are supposed to be attractive. And it was supposed to kind of show the divide there as there well. There are many shades of it, I, I think. Um, a lot of people manipulating the system. Uh, it does remind me, though, of like Salazar Slim in one of the four members of Hogwarts like I've always thought why would the evil house be part of it but what if you gave the evil house like that guy all the power to run Hogwarts he probably back then <laughs> wouldn't have been like completely evil if he had if he had taken that role he might have tried to be what Magneto is trying to do here um and then you have the baddies uh are not that scary so far it, they kind of remind me of the red hand where it's it's more a character study of of our favorite character heroes versus having to watch any of these villains so Gingrich isn't that scary because his tolerance is extinction line is what the last Henry Peter Gyrich or yeah his mind is uh that's who they use to find out where Bolivar Trask is in the first episode and all that went sort of over my head one of the my cons though is about the uh the, the malfunction of Cerebro it feels like every it's a clutch that they use or a crutch that they use so often in the X-Men universe where P Professor X or Gene goes into it and like, I don't know, like four times out of 10, 
they, they, they lose themselves in it or something <laughs> goes horribly wrong or the world then like explodes. Like it's not a safe place to use. And that's what happens to Jean. She gets like stuck in there for a few minutes. Well, I know his tolerance is extinction line is what the last three episodes. It's like supposed to be part one, part just two, don't part see three much of, of the finale is supposed to be. I think he's supposed to be the big bad for the full season. Right now, I think the big bad is themselves like trying to figure things out um it, it yeah it, so many humans are out there trying to kill them but like none of them really hold that much of an edge mm -hmm. now that storm isn't there we'll see how that works there are also my cons is that there's some some stuff that like doesn't make sense at all like why they would keep death the the death certificate of charles xavier on his desk in <laughs> the school when people could be using like it's just a strange thing to do when someone dies is to leave their death certificate on their own is it just supposed to be a reminder yeah and then also i i have no idea but there's also the scene where um magneto is being picked up and they come out so proud of themselves because none of their guns have metal in them and so like it, but then they came in helicopters and like no one like he immediately uses the helicopters against them and then laughs at them but like who's running this organization like the u.s government or whoever is involved in putting him into this uh into the collar like it doesn't make sense how they wouldn't have thought that the helicopters would have needed when i saw the drawings of him in the courtroom it did remind me of Superman? game of thrones oh. it reminded me of Tyrion almost no we we don't see too much of the trial it's mostly just televised it's a lot of people saying he deserves to be um imprisoned or whatever uh it reminded me more of again captain america in mcu when he was arguing for or against i forget uh was it tony who wanted them to sign yes yes uh to be beholden to the people um versus also in superman where he opts to let them take him in so that they can have the trial and then immediately they have to free him to let him like save the world or something bad happens at that trial nothing ever good happens at a superhero trial um yeah so my verdict my ultimate verdict is that the second episode saved this show the first episode felt like a five to me kind of basic wow second well i mean that's just average second Second episode, though, I think was a seven. So you think I'm going to give it a six, right? Because that's, that's right in the middle. No, yeah. no, no, no. I'm giving it a seven because I think that the second episode shows for sure. I'm giving the first episode the leniency of pilotitis. Mm -hmm. I think the seven episode, the second episode is a better reflection of what the series stands for. Um, it's better than a lot of the other revivals out there that are just cashing in on old animation style. I'm looking at you, He-Man. He um, <laughs> And uh, the nostalgia's there. They did. The they have the song, yes. which I know people are super happy about. They did the mix of 2D and 3D animation and then had the layer that you like were saying to get the 90s aesthetic. In fact, Kevin Feige said two things. He said, if you can get the people who voiced the actor and if you can get the songs, but more importantly, the intro songs and actually the Newton brothers who do the music for the show have done all the Mike Flanagan shows. And most recently, they did Five Nights at Freddy's as well. But I you're going to give the series an overall seven. Yeah, say. I'll give these two episodes overall a seven. The the funny thing is, if you ask me about any animated show from the past and you tell me they got the original writer back, the creator, and then they've got the original cast back, right? And then they are trying their best to make the animation style fit the thing. I would think that anything would succeed if that was true. But whenever they bring stuff into the current, they usually recast with more famous actors. Yeah. They usually bring in a new writing team and try to implement storylines that have like kind of more political like ramifications and this is political but it feels like something they totally would have done in the 90s jubilee also reminds me so much of like the captain planet type character that you would see i'm pretty sure one of them was like love or or, or earth or something she's very similar to those um yeah but overall seven out of ten what do you think i wanted to touch upon the actors that they actually weren't able to get because norm spencer who voiced cyclops and david hemblum who voiced magneto passed away and Jean gray was replaced with jennifer hale but hale has done the role since since 2008 but it's like strange we do <laughs> because the og people uh they they were still in the show but they were void they had changed roles and it feels like it was almost a game of pong when you hear what actually happened here so the og jubilee played by allison court in court voices abscissa she hasn't shown up yet and she wanted jubilee to be voiced by an actual asian woman who and now it's holly chow but chris potter who plays gambit but now holly chow isn't uh aquafina you know like, <laughs> yes. she, it's not someone who's got a huge name that they didn't do it for that reason they did it because yeah 
yes, this better reflection. But again, going back to the OG person, Chris Potter, who played Gambit, now voices Cable, and the voice for Cable is playing a villain named the Executioner, and the voice yeah, no, for Executioner Morph... is the guy I told you about. He's the one who is the main human, like, terrorist that in the second episode almost takes out Magneto, um, and instead takes out Storm. Yeah, he's supposed to be very big, right? He's, like, big and orange. That no, I'm not going to say that because I think everybody in the show is super big. Like, that just, that's, no. <laughs> the voice for Morph... He's got a scar. ...in the OG now plays President Kelly, and then, like I said, Ross McCann took over as Professor X's voice. But the series, in terms of what it's gotten in reviews, has been critical acclaim. It has a 9 on IMDb with around 2,000 reviews, has 100% on Rotten Tomatoes critic score, 94% audience score, 9 on IGN, and every single place, it seems like, is saying that this is one of the best series to come out this year. You can tell it's one of the more thoughtful comebacks, and I think that's what it comes down to, is people are very happy that they can throw this in on the old episodes and it feels like it's the same show now why did they choose to change the title because i think 97 is a cool tag on but if they kept it to be the x-men the animated series do you think they just wouldn't have pulled in as much of an audience is no, the yeah. 97 pulling the 90s kids well again it, it ended in 97 and that's when season six was going to take Perfect. place so that yeah. was really the reason i was hoping that you were going to talk a little bit about the first shot of the show because the first shot is after the intro new york city and it, it, it was supposed to have things like the DaCosta family company poster because DaCosta, when they were saving him, he was talking about how his family was very rich. It had Vistacorp, which is the company that Scott Lang stole from and ended put, end up putting him in jail. Once once it was clear that DaCosta, like uh, that Jubilee had like this crush on him and I was like, OK, well, he'll show up again and they'll probably have a little fling and he's going to save the day once or in a while. Like I just kind of got sick of his character. That's why the second episode felt way better because I was like, oh, Magneto's in charge. <laughs> Magneto's in charge. What's going to happen next? I know that in the intro, Magneto is supposed to be seen as nicer because of his lightning that comes from his thumbs in the original is supposed to be something like red. Just but like here, the Joker's supposed to be nicer. Here, it's supposed to be yellow, so it's supposed to show more companionship as well. Yeah, I guess we're getting really into the into the woods on this one. Well, like, yeah. for example, Stark Industries had a poster in no the way, New York really? thing. Yeah, yeah. I, that's for rewatches. People who are just watching it the first time are not going to catch everything. Um, I did think in the first episode when Dakota to use this power that was the coolest animation bit because it had like all these like it looked like a wormhole was developing where his arm <laughs> is no, no, no it's it wasn't funny it was like really it was cool but what out of all their powers which one would you decide to have oh that's the age-old question right um i think it was funny entering the show because i was like you know storm never really gets the credit that she deserves she i know she doesn't use her power to its full extent however like out of all those characters we always give magneto and xavier such big props but like storm could be on the other side of the planet and i feel like she has such abilities that she could control the whole entire planet so you would want storm's power i'm not saying i would want it i'm just saying like i'm really happy that they actually kind of gave her that that uh they kind of described it that way like they finally gave her that credit that is it, it was always due some of the powers are really kind of lame like i feel like bishop's power and wolverine's power and even beast power even though he's a genius like it they just are just strength. I mean, Wolverine is like immortal, isn't he? So that's, that's true. That's true. He is, but he's also so stupid. He's so <laughs> stupid in this series, and and I knew that going. But in. that's how he's supposed to be portrayed. And I remember it, Hugh Jackman at one point did take on the yellow uniform, right? Yes, that's supposed to be, I think, in the next Deadpool movie. Yeah, in the trailer or something. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else you want to add before? No, you end that's it? about. Thanks it. for listening. We'll see you on the next episode. Hope you enjoyed this one. Bye. Bye. Bye.